My name is Jeremy Collins. I'm the director of conferences and symposia here at the National World War II Museum. And with us today is a long friend of the museum and supporter who has written quite a remarkable story. This story fits at any time in our calendar year, but we thought it was most appropriate to wrap up our Women's History Month programming here at the end of March. Dr. Raquel Ramsey is a retired teacher and is the widow of Nadine Ramsey, the subject of this book, the widow of Nadine's brother, Colonel Edwin P. Ramsey, a decorated World War II hero and the executive producer of Never Surrender, the Ed Ramsey story. Ed has a fascinating story in his own right, and maybe Rocky and I will get to that in this conversation, but we are uh, here to talk about Nadine. As I mentioned, Raquel is a long friend of the museum, so much so that she has entrusted us with the care and preservation of both Ed and Nadine's archives here in New Orleans, so that the artifacts and the records can be stored and protected for generations to come, so that others may learn from these two wonderful and remarkable American heroes. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ramsey and to begin the program. Dr. Ramsey, could you please tell us about the first time you met Nadine and tell us what inspired you to write her story? I think I wanna start first by telling you what a pleasure it is for me to be here with all of you in the National World War II Museum because it brings me back to when Ed and I would visit the museum he would speak to veterans. He would give, you know, uh, lectures. And then we would meet our friend, Jimmy Carrington, who lives in Slidell and actually was his head of security during World War II. So that's our connection with the museum. And so that became a part of me. And so I am very emotional right now because I feel like I am coming back to that time when Ed and I were there. But what's wonderful is that I never thought that I would have Nadine's collection there too. And that all came about from my husband who said to me, Rocky, you need to write Nadine's book because she had more guts than I ever did. And I said, honey, that's not possible. You were four years behind enemy lines. He said, wait till you find out. And I tell you, Jeremy, it took three years for me to dig and I did find out what a woman. So I am so blessed to have two heroes, two congressional gold medals in my house, which by the way, you gotta visit my mini museum. <laughs> it's not as big as yours, but I mean, it has a lot of memorabilia. And uh, I met Nadine when I married Ed, and that was 1980. And so from that time on, we became a bond. She became really my sister because we would talk every day at four o'clock in the afternoon because all she cared about is what did Ed and I do during the day? It was not about her, it was about us and what a wonderful sister he had. And now I understand the love that they had for each other. And that all comes through when I met her. And uh, we had a great life together with Ed, 34 years of marriage. And Nadine passed away before he did when she was 85. Ed passed away at 96. So, I mean, all along the way, now I miss them both, but I'm so thrilled to be talking about them today. And thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, National World War II Museum for carrying the mission of the legacy of this brother and sister. Well, thank you. And on that point, we, we are contacted pretty much daily by family members whose loved one or loved ones served. And very often you hear about a family with multiple brothers in the mm -hmm. service, mm -hmm. uh, often in harm's way. Uh, very seldom do we hear about the uh, a brother and sister combo who both were in harm's way. So thank mm -hmm. you for for 
writing this story down, for preserving it, and for sharing it with us today and, and in perpetuity. So I want to get into the story itself, but also the process. Um, can you tell us uh, if, in brief what who was Nadine and what makes her significant within this very small cadre of women in World War II before we get into the process story? Well, when you think about women in those days, would they be flying planes? Can you imagine the kind of planes that were going on there? When I see Nadine walking on her plane, I could never do that. And so she was a woman ahead of her time. And she was a woman who wanted to fly. In the words of Major General Jenny Levitt, who wrote the foreword to our book, she said, I became an F-15 pilot because of the WASPs. So here is the present day pilots today giving tribute to the women of before. And so for Nadine, it was, I need to fly. And she was bugging her brother because he loved to ride horses. For Ed, it was all about the cavalry, the horses. And that is why mom put him in the military academy where they had horses at the Oklahoma Military Academy. And he was happy there. And she said, no, no, you got to learn how to fly because the war is coming. And it was like she had a premonition, and this was true. So for her, she was a stunt and racing pilot. So you can imagine the barnsters at that time, you know, they were barnstorming everywhere. That's what Nadine did. And mom is saying, what, what are you doing? But then she gave her full support. And so she had the support of her brother and the support of her mother, but she was that kind of a woman. And that's why I nominated her to the Women in Aviation Pioneer Award for next year. And so, I mean, these are the pioneers, you know, and that's why she was a woman ahead of her time. And I am so proud of that background. And so what were her obstacles? My God, that nobody was doing this. And, and for you to go into a military that was not military, it was not supported by the government, this was really on your own. They had to spend for their own uniforms. They had to spend to fly from place to place. Can you imagine, Jeremy, if I had to change planes? I'm really upset. I want to go fly directly to the, to the site. She had to go from place to place, pick up the next plane, and from across the United States, bring that plane to New York and New Jersey, and that's where they will bring it to World War II. So these are stops. And all along the way, they would sleep, sleep in the uh, airport or in a hotel outside because they didn't have the money to be able to pay for a hotel room or anything like that. So you just have to think about what were the circumstances? And why would you want to do that when you don't have any and no perks? No, no benefits, no nothing, because you're not supported by the U.S. government. So that was tough. And, and this was for the WASPs, who, yeah. uh, who were the female pilots who were primarily testing uh, some of the planes, but Correct. mostly ferrying these planes from ferrying factories or, yeah. or air, uh, to the airfields or to Correct. possible deployment to the Pacific Correct. Theater yeah. or the European Theater. Yeah. Um, and and why, why were the wasps needed? Well, because the men were all at war. So in order to look at logistics, how do you move the materials? It's a perfect example, Jeremy, like what's happening in Ukraine with the Russians. The Russian huge force that's going on there, they're falling apart. Why? Because there are no vehicles that are moving the materials to them. So it is so important at that time when, when they set up the WASP and they created the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, we need women because all the men are fighting now and we need these women to bring the equipment. And they were the vehicle to do that. So they are so vital to the, to, to the war effort. Absolutely. Um. 
let's let's get a little bit into the writing. It, it's sort of history with process here. Yes. Um, <laughs> it, with this being so close to family, I would think it's it's easy in a way because you have the archives. You knew the the person. You knew Nadine. But I also assume there would be some obstacles associated with that. Were, what were some of the things you had to overcome, uh, whether it was how deep to dive with Nadine and her story, uh, how intimate of details to provide, uh, to include things that may not be pleasant or that she may not want have wanted shared. But can you tell us about some of the obstacles in, in bringing Nadine's story to life? Okay, the first thing is that Nadine was gone. When I did this story, right after Ed passed away, I got involved as executive producer of Never Surrender. So instead of diving into writing her book, I was producing Never Surrender. I said, honey, you're taking a lot of my time. You wanted me to write the book, but I don't have the time. I'm doing this production of your story. And then, so she was gone already. So I could not talk to the person because she wasn't there. That was the number one obstacle. Number two, he gave me boxes. Can you imagine, Jeremy, you got a lot of boxes there in the museum. And every time I would open a box, I would find pictures with no labels. I don't know who the people are. <laughs> I couldn't even ask Ed because he was gone too. So who am I going to be talking to? So I thought, okay, I'll get from the St. Louis, her military archives. And when I was working with my co-author, Tricia Oran, she herself said, Rocky, what are this? There were piles this high of files on Nadine, which I had no idea. She was civil air patrol. She was commander teaching the cadets. I never knew anything of this because Nadine never talked about her story. She was so uh, humble. All she cared was Ed, 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 my hero brother. And it was not about her. And now Ed has given me a mission and I got to carry that mission, but I don't know how I'm going to do this because I've got boxes, but with no labels or anything. So that was my first obstacle. No people to talk to because they are also gone. What did I have? Ed's children. All right, so I have Ed Jr. I have Doug Ramsey, who is really my partner in everything. Doug is not only a television anchor for years, but also a, an accomplished writer. And, and uh, everything in his background was all journalism and television. So he was great to work with me and he calls me every night. That's my dog, Ramsey. I mean, just absolutely top of the line. And then, I mean, so I'm saying, okay, so I got some members of the family. Then I got Trisha, which I was happy. I was happy because Steve Revell, who was the co-author of Ed's book, Lieutenant Ramsey's War, who, by the way, is two-time Academy Award winner and nominee, he said to me, Rocky, you got to write that book of Nadine as Ed wanted. And I said, okay, so he says, I've got the person that you can work with. And he was his, her, his prodigy, Trisha Oran. She's a screenplay writer. And so she had never written a biography. So here are the two of us kind of trying to piece the narrative. So that was the challenge. And then how do you work with a co-author? I've never written a book. I've never, I've taught English for 50 years at Beverly Hills High School and Yeshiva University High Schools of Los Angeles and international schools, but I never have written a book. And that is a whole different story than teaching English. So here we are together, putting together Nadine's story. And Great. It's well, so I've, exciting. Dr. Ramsey, I've, uh, <laughs> I've, my job here is to interact and host the authors and even those who have published many books say that it's not exactly an easy process. So um, you, you mentioned boxes and stacks of files from mm -hmm. the National Personnel Records Center and from the family archives. 
uh, obviously with uh, with that much material, yeah, there certainly had to have been some aha moments in your research process that maybe you hadn't uh, heard from Ed or Nadine herself or the family in all the years that you've been uh, yeah, been part of that family. Can you share with us some of those aha moments, please? Well, to me, the first aha moment was the fact that she was Civil Air Patrol, because I didn't even know what Civil Air Patrol was. <laughs> and I find her picture and her uniform and all. But the most aha moment was about her P-38. If you ask the question, who's the only woman who owns her own P-38? The answer is Nadine Ramsey. And she has in the book, I'd like to read lines from page 154, chapter 11, her own P-38. Beginning in the spring of 1945, surplus war planes were ferried to sail centers across the country. Some of them by former WESPs. The aircraft ran the gamut from war weary and damaged to those with fewer than 100 flying hours. In early February 1946, Nadine learned that nearly 500 P 38 Lightnings were for sale at Storage Depot number 41 of the War Assets Administration, formerly the Kingman Army Airfield in Kingman, Arizona. There, thousands of war plus and decommissioned aircraft were lined up in rows across 4,000 acres of desert, waiting to be turned into scrap metal. The lightnings, which each cost 115,000 to make more than 1.6 million in 2020 dollars, were going for 1,250 per plane less than 18,000 in 2020 dollars. A P-38 at that price was a steal, but on her instructor's salary, Nadine didn't even have that much money readily available. She knew her brother would understand her reason for buying a P-38, so she called Ed and asked for a loan. When he heard what she wanted, he laughed and said, yes. On Valentine's Day, Nadine went to Kingman and found the plane of her dreams. She bought it on the spot, making her P-38 one of only 10 planes that were ultimately purchased in Kingman. She flew it back to Long Beach the same day. Sure enough, Nadine's purchase made the news. On February 15, the Los Angeles Times printed a two column article headlined, Women Go Shopping. This woman went shopping and flew home with a P-38, noting that while most women are still waiting for their post-war dreams of nylons, clothing, and household articles to materialize, Nadine Ramsey of 5300 Hunbury Street, Long Beach, had hers all wrapped up yesterday. Only it wasn't a feminine item. Nadine said the reporter had stepped figuratively and actually into the stratosphere. When she picked up a bargain at such a saving that womankind everywhere can envy her without reserve. She not only scored a neat victory over all bargaining hunting competitors, but so far as is known, she became the first female civilian in the world to own outright one of the world's fastest airplanes. I thought that that was the biggest aha moment for me. <laughs> and, and you see on the cover, like people are looking at the cover, that's her plane, the P-38. It is just absolutely amazing for me. There it is in Life magazine. That's why Life uh, Stackpole, Peter Stackpole decided to do a, uh, a photo shoot with her on her plane and she. And that is the Life magazine cover. Thanks, Jeremy, for sharing that so people could see it. <laughs> um, so uh, let's let's get into the wasps. Uh, you mentioned how unique Nadine was, and she truly was. 
But can you tell us about women in aviation uh, in the 20th century prior to World War II? Um, it, it's not what we normally hear about and aviation was pretty new. So Absolutely. tell us about the women experience and, and their involvement with aviation. Well, first of all, women were not even thought of to be in aviation. Then they had the discrimination by men. Men didn't really like the idea that these women are coming into this field. They had the dominance. So they had to fight also that kind of discrimination that was going on then. They were needed and that's why they were there. But when they were no longer needed, in 1944, they disbanded the West. Now you can imagine what someone like Nadine would feel. Okay, so I gave my life because there were 38 women who died in action. They were not buried by the US government. They couldn't be buried in Arlington because they had nothing to do with the military. They were not veterans. And then everything they had to spend on their own. So here are the Wasps kind of abandoned, left on their own. But for Nadine, it was pride. She loved the United States. She was a patriot. And that's the reason she did it, even if it was such a difficult task. Like we said, Jeremy, they would be ferrying, which you mentioned, planes. And therefore, you have to jump from place to place with no place to stay and nobody giving you any kind of salary, a minutative salary that you're being paid and no benefits or anything. So this was the conditions going on at that time. So when women today, like Major General Jeannie Levitt, when she talked to me, and she will be interviewed for, for uh, taking flight, the documentary, she said, Raquel, I would like to be interviewed at the West Museum, which we will be doing. Because she said, not in my office as commander of Randolph Air Force Base. I want it there because that's the women that gave me the impetus, the initiative, the aspiration that I was going to become one of them. And of course, General Levitt is the first woman veteran flying the F-15. So I was honored to have asked her and she said, I'm honored that you asked me because she said for three reasons and I'm gonna quote her. Rocky, she says to me, cause people who know me very well call me Rocky. And she said, Rocky, we have three things in common. One, horses, she rides horses. That's it, horses all over. Number two, flying like your sister-in-law. I mean, she said, I didn't fly till I was 18 years old cause mom, was so protective of me, you can't go on a plane. And number three, I went to Bataan and Corregidor with the Air Force, and I found where your husband was there four years behind enemy lines. She said, for those reasons, I'm so proud to be able to write the foreword to your book. And so when you hear someone like Major General Levitt, this are the women of today, they are saying it is the women's Air Force service pilot that paved the way. They were the pioneers who made us see we can do this. It is really the goal. And she said the words, I will quote her, aim high, reach your goals. And that is really true. You can go anywhere you want, but you got to have the belief. And that's what Nadine had. She had patriotism love of country. And of course, she was so proud, even if it was such a hard job. And when they disbanded them, what did she do? She started selling planes in Long Beach, because that's where she was living. And so here you have the transitions that she made in her life, from stunt and racing pilot, to women's Air Force Service pilot, ferrying planes, and then to selling airplanes. And that's basically what Nadine was all about. 
So Dr. Ramsey, if we can, I've got a couple wartime questions. Um, okay. You had mentioned the, the WASP pilots who, uh, who perished in service to our country in World War II. Um, did, did Nadine know any of them? And then a, a follow-up that I can ask again is, uh, what, if any, close calls did she have that you discovered on her missions, on her uh, ferrying missions? Perfect. So starting, starting with any uh, uh, close personal or professional losses. Oh, Helen Sorensen. In fact, I have the paper where she wrote the letter to Helen Sorensen, and she was devastated. She was so close to this lady and she perished. So this was a reality check. You can die doing this. And yet she pursued, but it really tore her apart. And so what I did in order to have her and remember her is we made a copy of the letter that Nadine wrote and it is in the book, writing to her family, Helen Sorensen. Then you talked about, I like your questions, Jeremy, in terms of what happened in terms of your second question, which was, so here they are, so sorry about those that died. And now your follow-up question, Jeremy, had to do with what, what uh, could you repeat that? Yes, uh, uh, did Nadine herself have any close calls, any uh, hard landings or any mechanical oh, failures, yes. anything you came across that was quite Oh, early. yes. In 1940, this is even before she was with the WASP. So she was ferrying the plane and then it had a downdrift that dragged the plane down and she didn't want to come down on the, on the houses. So she continued and she was able to make a pretty bad landing or in the propeller got out of whack and she was kissing the propeller, they had it on the noose, that she lived through that. Then another accident she had, they had to cut her foot a little shorter. And they said, we will have to do that. She said, if you take off my foot and I cannot fly, you might as well kill me. She said that to the doctor. And there is Ed, you know, looking after her and all saying, no, 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 we got to make sure that, you know, she survives again. I mean, this, this family are all survivors. <laughs> I mean, they go through all of this <clears throat> hardships and they survive. And so that was another close call. So I really liked your question because now does it happen to you? It did happen to her and she survived that, you know, close call. And she had a part of the foot shortened and then her her shoe is now a little elevated they made it a little elevated so she would be even you know but uh that was it and she was back on the plane that is really where you see if a horse throws you off this is what ed says you go back on that horse <laughs> and i say no more horsey i don't want to have anything to do with you i mean this people had guts and therefore, when I say that Ed said to me, Rocky, you got to learn about Nadine's story and write it. And that was the answer to the question you were asking me. How was I inspired? It was actually keeping a promise to Ed. I will write your sister's story and tell the world who Nadine Ramsey was because she was so humble. She never talked about herself at all. The, um, if we could stick in the war time, you had referenced. We don't need to go into or share all of Ed's story. That would be a that would be a one hour webinar in its own right, and maybe uh -huh. we'll have you back for that. But uh, he was behind the lines for four years. He was in the Philippines when the Japanese attacked in December of 1941, and stayed there throughout. You had mentioned uh, James Carrington, Jimmy Carrington, who led a band of Filipino guerrillas. Correct. Um, what did Nadine know about Ed's situation? Was there any or or any communication at all, or was it non-existent? Did the family fear the worst? And then a follow-up: How did that affect Nadine's? Uh, you say this this deep love of country and patriotism. How how obligated did she feel to the war effort because of 
her brother's situation. So let's let's talk about the communication and and how this affected Nadine. Well, let me tell you, when you are behind enemy lines in the cavalry, Mom Nell Ramsey and Nadine Ramsey didn't know if Ed was alive or dead. As a matter of fact, Jeremy, this is so interesting. The Oklahoma Military Academy listed Ed as missing in action. It was on the wall, missing in action. They didn't know where he was. And suddenly, another article from Life magazine comes out, and this is from a cavalry trooper that is marching on. And then in the article, it says, Ed Ramsey is leading this cavalry platoon. She finds out from a Filipino, Amado Bautista, who brings it to her and says, Mom, your son is here. What? She reads it in Life magazine. Can you imagine? And this was, again, another to me aha moment in terms of Ed, but it was in terms of Nadine and mom. Finding out your son is not missing in action, he is there, but he is behind enemy lines. And therefore, I mean, can you imagine the impact? Mom waited, and there is a telegram, this is really very moving, that arrives on Mother's Day saying from the military that he is now found in, in a hospital. I mean, but all the time, the lingering, the waiting, I don't know how I could survive that. Did, did Mom Ramsey, uh, did she ever try to dissuade Nadine due to the uh, perilous nature of, no. of the work, or did she know that was a lost cause? Oh, absolutely, because Nadine was totally committed, totally committed. This is my life, not just flying, but flying in peril. I mean, you know, if I would just have fun growing up in a balloon, you know, <laughs> but this is wartime and you're going in the circumstances. I mean, it just proves the kind of patriotism that both all the family had, but it was Nell supporting her children. And that's what I call is love. What kept them all together? Love, love of mom, love of sister. And I will tell you before we have our own story on Ed, that Never Surrender actually came from a letter that Ed wrote, which I found in the boxes that I was telling you, Jeremy. And he said, it is either the war ends or I die fighting because I will never surrender. Wow, I couldn't sleep that night. I said, I'm not opening boxes at night anymore <laughs> because I can't sleep after reading it. And that's what Vanilla Fire used as the opening and the title of the film, which is the documentary of Ed. But this even reinforced the love that she had for flying, even if she was now disbanded. So can you imagine the disappointment and I have interviewed a number of WASPs who said that was the most devastating day of their life. Because now, where do you go? There is no benefits that you got nor anything. And you lost your path. Your path was there. And they took it away from you when you gave your life for your country. It's really tough. And so this is at the uh, towards the end of the war and after the war, the, mm -hmm. uh, the need for female pilots to 44. serve. In, it happened in 44. Uh, the need to uh, fill the gaps that uh, were caused by the men being overseas flying combat missions, uh, oh, right. that the women were no longer needed as the men began coming home and, and the ferrying missions ended. Um, did how did this make Nadine feel about her military service? Uh, this, the, you've mentioned a number of times the, the patriotism. Um, did she have a bitter taste in her mouth about her service or about just about the treatment of the Air Force, the Army and the government towards the women, uh, the WASPs? She never had 
that kind of feeling, which many other women did, you know, because she had a brother, which she felt she was supporting, you know, here is Ed. I mean, having a brother that has gone to war. So she felt, well, this is part of the war effort. If you don't need me anymore. But there was also disillusionment, you know. It's like, this was my job, and now you have taken it away from me. And at the same time, you haven't given me any recompense. So what do you work for now? You work for the West, became a big unit. Let us go for veterans status. Let us go for recognition. Let us go for being buried in Arlington. And I want to tell you, Jeremy, all of those have been achieved. And that is why today, I mean, when I think about all these women, and as we are making now the documentary, we're going to be focusing on how, when did they become veterans, 1970. I mean, so step by step, and then comes the Congressional Gold Medal. As a matter of fact, Nadine got her Congressional Gold Medal before it, because uh, President Obama signed that in 2010. And so it was given to the West. So Ed and I received that. And what was so interesting is that Gerald Levitt was at the back of the room. I had no idea who she was. And she said to me, wow, there is Nadine, you know, among all, she didn't know who Nadine was or anything. But to me, this was the significant move that finally the government recognized them with a congressional gold medal. And so to me, that's priceless here in the house. Then my husband got his after from the Philippine scouts, the Congressional Gold Medal. Of course, he had received the Silver Star, the Distinguished Service Cross. I mean, all of those from General MacArthur. But I mean, this recognition from Congress of this women came now. Now, uh, on the point of recognition, they, obviously after the fact decades later have been recognized and celebrated um, perhaps not not enough but much more so mm -hmm. uh, during the war you know, you've mentioned a few news articles um, mm -hmm. just about Nadine herself how how were they covered how were they treated while the war was going on and they were truly needed for the war effort were they were they celebrated were they uh, sneered at for being women doing a man's job? How was how well, was well? They called them. Some of the articles went lipstick pilots of World War II. Okay, <laughs> of course, Nadine always wanted to put lipstick on her lips. I mean, she would do that every time she would get into the cockpit. That's what they were. So there was a little bit, oh, especially with the men, there was this jealousy. You know, what are those women getting into our field and all? But you had Rosie the Riveter. I mean, all these women ahead of her time getting into all these areas. That's how Nadine got into Lockheed Martin and all of these companies that were selling planes. So they were in one way thanked for the service that they did, but they were not really elevated to the point of what the Congressional Gold Medal was. This was real recognition for the job you did and man did you do it so well you know it was absolutely fantastic that was the height of the uh, uh, recognition the um, <clears throat> you you mentioned Nadine had uh, had not well I guess in a way she had gone back to her pre-war life mm -hmm. uh, many of the women because there were very few if any opportunities, did indeed have to revert to their civilian life and, and stop flying. Um, Nadine sold planes. Can you tell us a little bit about her, her post-war life uh, as it pertains to planes and personally? Um, tell us about what happened after the war when she got out of the WASPs. So for her, her home was Long Beach because that's where she started with uh, B.J. London, who was her commander of the ferry here in Long Beach. So she moved from what was Kansas, now she is in California. She became a Californian, she became a Long Beach resident, and she lived there all her life. 
up to the time I came into their life when I married Ed, which was 1980. So we would visit her. I mean, here she was, you know, never focusing on what she had done before. For her, that was the past. So much so that I couldn't find any of her log books or anything because that's where I began to see the resentment she had. Some of the pictures, she cut them up. And I tell you, now I began to realize that even if she didn't say it openly, it hurt her very much. I'm no longer flying. What kind of life do I have now? So along the way, she married. In fact, she writes in the West newsletter that the worst decision she made was on men. <laughs> she married three times and always pilots. So she said, wow, that doesn't show what good judgment I have because every time I select a guy, it's always goes awry, you know? So she got married, they didn't have any kids. So she continues her life selling planes in different setups. One of them was right here in Long Beach. She became president of her company. She's on the newspaper selling planes and with BJ London, who was her commander of the West. They became best of friends. So when we were visiting Nadine in her later years, BJ London would be there, her best friend, and she would chat with her. They would give her certificates from Long Beach and all, honoring her together with the West. So that was just back to your plain, simple life of living every day. But yet she had a part of that resentment because I saw that. She didn't keep any of the log books and she tore up so many of those pictures. I was pasting them together <laughs> and get, being able to get them you know, into one piece. So there is where you feel what she was feeling because she didn't openly say anything of that to me at all. Not one word how the government treated me, not one word. And I, what was so interesting is that Ed, fought also for the Filipinos rights and privileges. We went to Washington three times and spoke in front of Congress. So he saw that with the injustice of his sister. And now it was him and the Filipinos who fought with him side by side, the Philippine scouts, because Ed is 26 cavalry Philippine scouts. So here he was again, fighting for the rights of those that were oppressed. But Nadine was there with the West, trying to get the veteran status, trying to get like the 99s, which is another organization. And so being part of those organizations, Nadine made her uh, spill about what the West needed in terms of recognition. She was there. You, you reference her, <laughs> uh, her post-war relationship with pilots, three of whom she married. Did you did you come across any uh, any notes, records, or or entries regarding her reception, her interaction with any of the male pilots during the war? I would assume it wasn't universally bad nor universally good. But can you tell us about some of her uh, uh, her interactions and and maybe how she and her fellow wasps were received with? with well, the male she was pilots? a lot older than the other wasp, so she was really regarded very highly by the men. She got along very well with them. And in fact, she never complained about, you know, how they treated her. They treated her very well. And General Hop Arnold, who was in charge of the thing, she was under Nancy Love and Dorothy Cochran. So you have this two teams. She was with, with uh, Nancy Love. And so she felt she was teaching men in the words of Ed, teaching men how to fly from bombers to fighters. And they took her training and her advice and she learned from them. So that's a real great thing, but she got along with them pretty well. Great. Um, mm -hmm. um, I'm not ready to open it to the full audience yet, but you just mentioned General Hap Arnold. And one of the questions I think 
your answer to this question might address General Arnold some. Uh, the question comes from Billy. Could the WASP women join the Army Air as pilots? Can you explain a little bit about what the designation was, why they were not uh, officially militarized or recognized during the war? The real reason was because they felt that they were just asked to come in because of need. So in other words, you're not really officially part of the Army, nor of the Air Force, nor of the Army Air Force. You are here as volunteers, okay? We need women to ferry planes, okay? You're great flyers and you love to fly, okay? Will you give your services? And they did, but there was no intent nor desire to embody them and make them part of the Army Air Corps. The, um, the similarity that I see is sort of like civilian contractors uh, that have been so heavily utilized over the last 20 years with our, our nation's conflicts uh, right. that uh, they, they did not have to. They were serving the country. They were assisting the military. Um, Obviously, the civilian contractors that are overseas are on the battlefronts, but that doesn't negate the uh, the dangerous nature of flying these planes. Uh, right, right. A, um, uh, one of the questions I have, and I hope I don't get ahead of the audience, you know, we've, we've talked about P-38s. Were there other mm -hmm. planes that Nadine flew when she was ferrying? What was the smallest? What was the fastest? What was the biggest? Well, she flew the p 51 Mustang. Favorite plane of one of her classmates that I interviewed, Jean Landis. In fact, she made a video of herself on that plane. Nadine flew every military aircraft that existed at the time. Very rare. And for the P 38, there were only eight women that flew that. And that is the reason why in my mini museum, and it's also in the book, the painting that shows the women, you know, autographing, actually the eight women were autographing this uh, painting, Young and Invincible. And that was portraying the P-38 because there were very few that were capable of flying that. They were really, you had to be very, very good in terms of being able to fly that kind of plane. But she was used to flying every military aircraft available. That's what makes her a pioneer. Um, we have a question here, um, and it looks like it goes to the pre-war years. Did Nadine have any involvement with the Women's Air Derby? Yes, not specifically the Derby, but she was a, a stunt and racing pilot. So these were the barnstorming women. She was not specifically a part of them, but she did that for shows. So she would go, the people would look at the audience and you know do the, uh, the, uh, the uh, program going, but she was not specifically a part of one group at that time, which were barnstorming, but she did it because she was a stunted racing pilot. That's where she began, you know, her loving to fly. My, uh, my own follow-up to that is um, many of the uh, famous pilots and commanders of the Army Air Force in World War II, uh, they were barnstormers before. Uh, mm -hmm. did, she, did she have any interaction? Did she come across them at any of these Derbies, or or was they were they on a separate circuit? They were in a separate circuit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did she have any wartime interactions with the General Arnolds of the world, or the Jimmy Doolittles, or Paul Tibbets? No, she did not. Mm -hmm. She only was uh, in direct contact with Nancy Love, who was her commander of the WASP, and uh, B.J. London, who became her commander for the Ferrying Command. Got a couple questions that just popped up. The first is from Margaret. She wants to know what happened to Nadine's plane. Did she fly it after the war? 
<laughs> what an interesting question. You would love this, Jeremy. I suddenly get this phone call from Rick Flaherty. And he says to me, are you Raquel Ramsey? I said, yes. Are you the widow of Colonel Ramsey? I said, yes. Do you know Nadine Ramsey? I said, she's my sister-in-law. Well, I have her plane in pieces. And he says to me, okay, we're gonna put the plane back together and it will be placed in a museum. And Paul Allen from the museum in uh, Colorado loves P-38s. And so when that is together there, or Nadine's plane might fly again. I'm going, Rick, yes. But my gosh, there are so many pieces that are needed to put that plane together. But he had the number of the plane. And in the book, you will see the fuselage and everything that was discovered. She had already sold the plane after because she couldn't keep with the fuel and all of that that was going on. And it was a couple that crashed with the plane. But he had bought it. And Rick Flaherty was the commander of uh, the F the uh, the uh, stealth fighter in uh, in uh, in the base, and he says to me, Rocky, her plane will fly again. I said, Really? You're putting it together? He says, No, the restoration will do that, and I have no idea when that will happen. So that's a real interesting question, and I'm glad they asked. Yes. Great. A uh, question from Tim on Facebook. It refers to a uh, a wartime film. Uh, a guy named Joe starring Spencer Tracy and Irene Dunn. Mm -hmm. um, Dorinda, who's the female character, uh, flew a P-38. Are you aware of the film? I watched the film a couple of times because I love Spencer Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the film Joe. And she was, to me, it was like Nadine was right there, you know, flying the plane. It was a terrific movie. I really liked it so much. And that was already a film that was telling you what women were able to do in those days. And he was all champion of her, you know, uh, Spencer Tracy. So I love that film, absolutely. I got uh, it, Joe. <laughs> yeah, I, I recommend it as well. It's, um, it, it is one of those that has a message. It's not just a good story, mm -hmm. but it wanted mm -hmm. to show the contributions um, to to give credit to the women who were contributing, but also to maybe encourage and inspire other women to uh, join the war effort in whatever way. But uh, it, it's a, a great film all around. Gary writes, growing up in Kansas, what was the first plane she soloed on? Oh, it was a Veli Mini Coop. In fact, there's a picture of her in the book she did the solo in six hours and got the license. She was one of the fastest learning pilots. She would uh, do this. And then of course she posts in the picture and we have that in the book. It was a Veli Mini Coop. <laughs> Great. Um, Malcolm wants to know how many WASP pilots were lost during the war. And after D-Day, were any pilots, female pilots, given permission to fly all the way to England? Can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the, the ferrying? What was the reach? You had mentioned New York and New Jersey, but did they go beyond the borders? Yes. Let me answer that second question. You know, yes, they went beyond the borders. In fact, Nadine was also ferrying in Canada. She lived with her husband in Edmonton, Canada, and was ferrying from there. So they were all over the world. A number of women went to Europe and to uh, Canada and what Nadine did in Canada. So it continued there. And then you mentioned the, your first question had to do with what Malcolm was saying. Yeah, how many WASP pilots were lost during World War II? 38, and they are honored in the WASP Museum in a big, uh, you know, a uh, tribute. And it is right there at the very entrance of the museum. Of course, now they have remodeled everything because Ed and I visited that in the 1990s with our motorhome. And we found a sketch of Nadine on the wall 
And of course, now all of this are all brand new hangars that have just opened up at the West. So this will be captured by Vanilla Fire when they fly there April 28 to 30 for the 80th anniversary. Um, a very good fo uh, follow up on that that I was going to ask is mm -hmm. um, just we we are very proud of what we do here and know that we have lots of loyal supporters watching from around the country and the world. But we never hesitate to spread the word about other good institutions. Where is the WASP Museum located? It is an Avenger Field, Sweetwater, Texas. And that is where Nadine trained. So one of her classmates, who passed away now, Dawn Seymour, was her classmate there in the training command. So I was able to interview one of her classmates in the training command and one of her classmates in the ferrying command. And that helped me a lot because I needed to know what did they know about her at that time. And uh, I was very happy, Jean Landis and Don Seymour and Iris Critchell. And then I have the authority on all books, Sarah Reitman. In fact, Sarah Reitman will be interviewed for our documentary. Sarah Reitman has written about 12 books on the West. She was our consultant specifically on the chapters of the WESPs in terms of the book. And uh, she has been such a great supporter and I love her. And we have, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Rock. Um, Go ahead. We, we have a, only a few minutes left, but there's uh, two good questions. They're all good questions. One <laughs> of which is, uh, it, could you explain the difference between the WAFs, the W-A-F-S and the WASPs? Were they the same? Well, in terms of their purpose, it was a supportive organization to carry the goals of recognition. That was the bottom, you know, the, the most important thing is get veterans status. So it was what field, Air Force, Navy, uh, Army, and the, the WASPs preceded what the Army Air Force would do. So for them, it was really recognition of the past more than now, today, what the WAFs do. And the WAFs were written about by Sarah Reitman in the first book that she wrote, The Originals. And Iris Critchell, that I interviewed her also, and she's there in one of the pictures with Nadine signing Young and Invincible, the painting, I mean, those are just, to me, priceless, priceless moments. Um, and with BJ London. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask two quick questions. One of them will be a longer answer, and that's what we'll end with. Uh, Cheryl, who's watching on Facebook, wants to know, is a book for younger readers being considered regarding Nadine's story, or do you have a recommendation for younger readers? Well, as a matter of fact, we are trying to get the story from Melissa Greenblatt, who is uh, the daughter of our best friend for 50 years, Dick and Sue Greenblatt. She's like my sister, Sue Greenblatt. She wanted to do a children's book with pictures and sketches and all. And that's what we're working on in terms of, so a children's book that will inspire young girls to become Flyers. But I would like to say to anybody, if you get a hold of some of the books, there is one book that Sarah Reitman wrote, which was on BJ London, and it was specifically a biography of her, but it was written for younger readers. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you. I want to bring the, uh, the program to a conclusion with a final question going back to our subject of Nadine, uh, but also back to her origins. Joanna wants to know, could you talk more about her early life and what prompted her desire to learn to fly? Well, she was a Kansas girl. And I wanna say that the biggest thing that touched me was that the University of Kansas Press took my book and published it there. To me, that was full circle 
This was her hometown. She was just living a, a difficult life because they went through the depression and all, but it was ingrained in her and not from mom, not from anybody. It was in her that she wanted to fly. She would run out of school and, and mom would say, what, she's not attending class? Because she was training to fly. And some of the best aviators were part of her, of her teachers at that time. So she already had that, but it was a, an ordinary life, difficult life in Kansas. But she found ways that she would be able to have some money to be able to fly. Hidden from her mom, because her mom didn't even know that she was flying. But that is true desire and goal. And she did it. Well, Dr. Ramsey, uh, Dominic, I think concludes this well with his comment, awesome talk. Uh, it's an you. awesome presentation on a truly remarkable person, not just woman, but a person who helped the war effort. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is Taking Flight, the Nadine Ramsey story. The author is Dr. Raquel Ramsey. And on behalf of the National World War II Museum and the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, it is a great pleasure and honor to host both of these women, Nadine Ramsey and Dr. Raquel Ramsey. Rocky, I look forward to seeing you again and hope your return to New Orleans is quick. Thank you for watching today. I invite you to uh, stay tuned to our events calendar and our emails to catch the next wonderful and engaging program that we have to offer. And uh, Rocky, I'd like to ask, do you have any closing words yourself? Yes, first of all, this is very, very touching for me. I wanna thank you, Jeremy. You have done a fantastic job. I loved our interaction and I love the responses of the questions of the people. You know, this has just been a wholesome, touching, thrilling moment for me. I'm pretty emotional at the moment, but I am so happy because I know Nadine and Ed are watching from above and applauding and saying, World War II Museum, you are our home. And I love you, Jeremy. I love Tony. I love everybody that is there. And New Orleans, we will be coming to film Ed's movie there. Thank Great. you so much. We'll, we'll see you when you're here. Dr. Raquel Ramsey, the book is Taking Flight, the Nadine Ramsey story. Thank you and everyone have a good and safe day.